Okay, so good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to this third thematic block of performance studies. Um, good afternoon. We have four papers and speakers. And speakers. Uh, the first one is entitled uh, Scenic Fires of Motion in Musical Performance by Nana Martinelli, professor and senior researcher at the Ukrainian Academy of Music and Theatre as well as the chair of the musicologist section at the Ukrainian Composers Union. Her paper, which is a part of the project Perception of Expression in Musical Performance, Trust Cultural Aspects and the Regional Case, uh, funded by the Ukrainian Research Council, uh, disputed and outlined those aspects of the performing audience communication process that may be considered failures of a certain motion in a musical performance and attempts to define the primary signifiers of the motion in a classical music performance. So now I give the floor to Professor Lina Nadike Martinelli whenever you want. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, I don't see anybody or nor anything, so please just let me know if you hear me well and you see the slides, and please tell me if something goes wrong in the meantime. We are hearing you perfectly, and, and for now we okay. see your presentation perfectly good. Thank you. So this will be a, a bit of a radio theater. <laughs> right. So in the act of performing music, a variety of significations occur that allow us, assuming the given performance is expressive or emotional, also the two should by no means be considered as being the same. Some of those significations are representations of sonic patterns, as the well-known germs model by Patrick Yeslin of approaching expression in musical performance demonstrates, while the others appear through gestural elements of a performance and equally serve an expressive function. This allows some researchers, like Jane Davidson, stating that vision can be more informative than sound in the perceiver's understanding of the performer's expressive intentions, and acknowledging, like Eric Clark, that performance is not only a sonic event. Recent research on the gestural aspect of performance has been developing based on the foundations laid by such scholars as David Lidoff, Francois de la Lande, Robert Hatton, and others. It has been demonstrated how important gesturality in performance, such as facial expressions and bodily movements of musicians, is in communicating emotions in music. In studying the physicality of the act of music performance and the intrinsic link between music and movement as a particularly significant aspect of musicianship, gesture quite naturally became a recurrent topic and a key concept. Following Hatton's central definition of human gesture as any energetic shaping through time that may be interpreted as significant, more specifically, musical gesture is something that first denotes a meaningful combination of sound and movement, and second, provides character and expression to a musical performance. Performers' actions, thus, can be viewed as thoroughly gestural. In relation to this, I will make an attempt in this paper to define the primary signifiers of emotion in a classical music performance and to analyze why they are perceived as such. It is important to note here that characteristic bodily responses of a performer may be discussed not only as determined by the performer's individual corporeal expression, but also by the sort of behavioral codes, conventional, if not codified, manners, the set of standards <coughs> that exist in the Western art music concert practices. The starting point of this research was the question whether a performance lacking in visually lacking in visually expressive gesture lacks also emotion as we perceive it in a romanticist virtuoso tradition. Interestingly, the hypothesis born during the course of the research was that it should be possible to extract some characteristic performance topoi in a Leonard Ratner sense. And it is interesting that while uh, submitting the abstract for this Congress, I had no clue that it will turn out to be so Ratner central given the round table just, uh, we, we just had now and also the early afternoon session of performance study. So uh, that is, I think that 
or I thought during the course of the research that it is possible to trace relatively objective and conventional meanings from how the musicians' gestures constitute the performance of music as embodied expression and shape the music for the audience sonically, interpretively, and affectively. Now, why Romanticism? Naturally, because of the influence of Romanticism on current performance practices and the imprint it still bears on the agents of the musical world. The Romanticist aesthetics with its artistic freedom, the interpreter's individuality and performative expression yielded the invention of the modern virtuoso. Two characteristics brought to the musician's repertoire by Paganini and later nurtured by Liszt were showmanship and sex appeal, to put it in Tim Blanning's words. Pathos, temper, charisma, and hypertrophied emotionality became the most significant features of the romantic performance. Up to date, one of the common requirements for a successful concert performer is manifesting a charisma, originality, finally, personality. Judging a performance, for instance, in music competitions, becomes something much more elaborated and perhaps vague when compared to following more conformity with, uh, mere conformity with the messages of the core. This is the passage from Naomi Cummings' book. I quote, personality is something possessed by the performer who transmits it through the instrument in a direct act of communication. It then takes on almost magical aura named in many ways. Herman Krebers describes another candidate in the competition as having lacked that essential magnetism, although he played beautifully with a great deal of intelligence. He was judged to be a marvelous concert master, but not a solid. His precise lack remains frustratingly undefined, Cummings says. A very important aspect of a musician's self, then, is those human subjective qualities, as Naomi Cummings sees them, stemming from voice, gestures and actions. At a very perceptual level, it is a performer's body as such that creates the identity and charisma of an artist. It is primarily through the person's gestures and postures that we witness their intended engagement with music. Not by chance, a significant part of Cummings' thinking on the performer's identity and of much semiotic thought in general, both in music and in theater, is devoted to the bodily signs of the performer. Similarly, according to Mark Lehman, it is through corporeal mediation that it is possible to engage in a behavioral resonance with music, so that personal subjective feelings, moods, flow experiences, and feelings of social bonding can be activated and exchanged." End of quote. The incentive to investigate expressive topicality and performer's gestural utterance sprang precisely from the fundamental role that corporeality and physical gestures play in musical communication. Now, once physical effort is directly related to artistic expression, and importantly, the display of this effort seems to be rather significant to the circumstances of a concert performance. The visual effect of virtuosity to the audience is the same, if not even stronger, than the auditory experience of the virtuosic passages played. To put it in Philip Auslander's words, in case where the performance of a musical persona does entail emotional expression, musicians may be said to engage in what Irving Goffman calls dramatization. This has to do with making visible work which goes into a particular routine that the audience would not otherwise see, so that the performer can get credit for it, and also with presenting an idealized image to the audience. In relation to musical performance, an idealized image of the musician as emotionally expressive is co conveyed through dramatizations of the process of music, making that purport to expose the musician's internal state while performing." End of quote. Now, before we move on to a more specific discussion and topical classification of diverse gestures and their significations in the act of music performance, I should remind that by now there exist many ways in which body movements in musical performance can be addressed, measured, and defined. Accordingly, uh, there are many ways in which musical gestures are meaningful. The most relevant premise for the purposes of this paper is that musical gestures are not only those that produce sound, but also those that the, those non-sounding physical movements of performers 
that are also as important carriers of signification. Moreover, musicians' gestures may be intended and involuntary. According to Elaine King and Jane Ginsburg, sometimes these gestures are produced deliberately following careful choreography and rehearsal. Sometimes they are produced spontaneously during performance, whether consciously or unconsciously, in response to the way the performer <laughs> feels the music at the moment, wishes to shape it or perceives the audience's reception of the performance. The latter remark is very significant since it brings out the communicative power of gesture. Several studies have shown that the listener's experience of music is intrinsically linked to their experience of a performer's movement. In fact, it can even be claimed that many a listener to a concert actually grasps the expressiveness of the performers from the musician's gestures rather than from the musical sounds. Moreover, the expressiveness and other types of information conveyed through musical gestures operate at the level of cultural agreement, which brings us precisely to discussing a gestural topic within a romantic performance. I shall not really propose here a glossary of gestural topics, although a temptation is really strong and some will be specified. This can partly be considered as a vocabulary of emotional states, the way the performers react to the music and affect their audiences. The claim here is that among the several possible functions of the performers' bodily gestures, especially under the public concert circumstances, there exist some archetypical patterns that communicate to the audience the culturally embedded meanings of the musical narrative, of the performer's personality, and of the stage persona, the romanticist convention as performer, hero, star, showman, virtuoso. Many contemporary pianists, and not only pianists, of course, especially those belonging to certain schools of piano performance, were educated through the prism of the Romanticist aesthetic paradigm, suggesting the importance of charisma, as I, I mentioned already, the primacy of subjective expressivity, impressive artistic effects, and personal individuality. And even those who were not, those have still been affected by the prevailing stylistic requirements, standardized behavioral codes and performance cliches related both to the creative output of a given composer, say Chopin, for instance, and to the very situation of stage performance. An intense level of intimacy versus emphasis on virtuosity, transcendental serenity versus broad dynamic spectrum, musicality and imagination versus magnetic eccentricity. These are all the features that the audience expects from a top level performance. Two quotes may be seen as symptomatic. First by Edward Said, who argues that musical performances are extreme occasions where virtuosic soloists intimidate a submissive crowd into a state of angst at knowing their performative inferiority. And second, by Peter Johnson, who offers a somewhat topical label of magisterial pianist. I quote, the unassuming figure of Alfred Brendel is transformed into the magisterial pianist as his fingers touch the keys, but the man returns as he quietly acknowledges the applause. The condition of a public event-oriented performance is very important here. Several comparisons come to mind, not only with the romanticist aesthetics, but also with the current pop culture, which is after all, mainly what the romantic virtuosity was about. In her research on the pop star, Robbie Williams, Jane Davidson mentions the cliche postures the performer displays acting out as the stage persona, such as raising an arm and pointing to the sky, full body dance-like spins and upward scooping hand gestures to encourage audience participation. Other authors also refer to live performances of rock bands where they observe stereotypical symbolic gestures developed through decades and found in many rock and metal groups as, as demonstrations of masculinity. <coughs> Albrecht Schneider states, such stereotypical routines, including gestures that are often seen as, as expressing power, freedom, and perhaps also machismo, are apparently expected by the audience as a genuine ingredient of a good live rock show. 
It is important to point out that any such performative expression is interpreted with reference to a social, historical, or associative convention of the genre, be it classical, mainstream, or pop music. Each of them, having their own codes of communication between the performers and the audience, build their specific gestural topics. The idea we get from the stage persona's gestural messages can be considered as culture-dependent signs, conceptualized by cultural and historical rules of expression display and perceived as intrinsically bound to the public concert context. One such corporeal message in the realm of a classical music recital, usually accompanying moments of serene, static sound or particularly pensive passages is the pianist's upward look and enacting of transcendence, like an inward dwelling gaze. Such a well-established romantic codes implies intimacy, contemplation, dream, or confession, and could easily be labeled a transcendence topic. This movement does not have any causal relationship with the sound. Rather, it is an ancillary gesture, a pattern that is used to specify the expressivity and strengthen the emotional impact of a performance as related to the expressive function in the famous model of language functions by Roman Jakobson. Hitting a final chord followed by a theoretical lift of both <coughs> arms can be seen as serving two functions to still use Jakobson's <coughs> model, native and static. Typically, hands are left suspended in the air for a few seconds at the end of a piece to convey the sense of apotheosis brought by the musical climax, hence the climax topic. <clears throat> This is one of the most extravagant, rather ritualized gestures, which would be difficult to relate to any sound producing or even sound facilitating movements. It is explicitly meant to excite the audience and induce its enthusiastic reaction after the triumphant culmination of a virtuoso performance. Similar may be the reason behind lifting just one arm, which can happen at the end of the piece or as the embellishment of a gesture that is also possible to perform in a slightly more natural, economic manner. In the latter case, this could be considered as serving a poetic function, while the former presupposes the previously mentioned combination of conative and phatic functions of communication. The fact that so many of these postures end up not only as stills from the videos of live performances, but also as pictures used in promotion or in concert reviews, proves in a way that they are appealing to the spectators and testify an emotional, inspiring, particularly engaged and engaging performance. In turn, they contribute to the further exploration of the same gestural topic. This is just the same gesture only in string performers. Now, particularly interesting, I found the historical context behind this gesture, which allows it to be labeled as a romantic hero gestural topic, as you can see on the slide. Also, the existing photographs of Franz Liszt show him normally playing or posing with both hands on the keyboard. It is explicitly one of the iconographic paintings that is really common in Lith popular imagery features him with a highly raised arm, a gesture so much prevalent in today's concert halls. Curiously, neither the author of this painting nor when it was made can be authenticated. And I really made quite some research and I still will do, but uh, so far it was uh, really difficult to get it. And it really looks like it's an, much older painting and definitely not from Liszt time. Yeah. Now, really curiously, uh, the early famous photograph of Niccolo Paganini portraying him with a similarly raised arm is still subject to a heated debate as to whether this daguerreotype is really an authentic picture of the legendary violinist. So two pictures of the same type and two are debatable. So are we now perhaps talking about some mythical romanticism or even hyper romanticization? Because it could be that some later generations saw the romanticist image precisely this way, this very uh, expressive uh, performer, this mythical virtuoso, and they started producing this type of imagery. 
So this attempt to demonstrate how certain gestural meanings in the art of music performance have reached through regular repetition and associated connotations, the status of communication codes, is just a small step towards a possible thesaurus of performance topics. Culturally enriched signification found both in musical works and their performances expands the realm for interpretation from a variety of perspectives. A possible next step could be to choose a particular musical work and connect the topical analysis of the score with one of gestural topics found in diverse performances. This way, we would likely find out new kinds of performance topics based on the performer's persona and their enactment of musical narratives. A conversation topic when the head and face movements of the performer are imitating a dialogue with two contra contrasting themes interacting, as for instance in the famous video of Lang Lang's performance of Reminiscences de Don Juan. A nocturnal topic when the pianist closes her eyes while playing a Chopin nocturne. A surprise topic with the raised eyebrows signaling the arrival of unexpected harmonies, and so on and so forth. It must be noted surely that with a certain degree of expressivity already latent in the musical work, the performer's tasks to be, uh, task to be or appear in our case expressive is somewhat facilitated. As Yuslin and others state, generative features may increase the emotional impact of the music, but do so mainly by enhancing the expression that is inherent in the structure of the piece. However, I do believe that the type of analysis presented in this paper could not necessarily be informed only in the direction of score to performance, but also the other way around, performance to score. It may happen that the sounding or visible interpretations, their expressivity, performance gestures, and characteristic details or manners that signify a certain emotion and emphasize a variety of musical nuances, could open up new interpretative spaces and offer new topoi born in performance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lina. Uh, now, picking the question time, uh, if there is any question from anyone in the audience. Okay, I will just uh, kindly ask you to, to speak always to the microphone because I hear really poorly. So if yeah. If the uh, questions are not to the microphone, then maybe somebody can repeat them to the mic. Thank you. Where is the microphone? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting paper. You, you said a lot about, about conventionality of gestures, but I'm wondering about the relations between universal element of uh, human movement correlated uh, with emotions uh, during uh, musical expression with uh, convention. Do you think that, that there is a possibility that this universal element can restrict somehow the conventions? I mean, the famous book of Manfred Klein's, Manfred Klein's uh, book, Centix, The Touch of Emotions, he, he is, he, uh, suspected that there are some very strict connections, for example, in the space of the gestures and some elements. So, uh, are you, um, do, do you think that it is possible to include this perspective into your, your proposal? Thank you very much. Yes, it is, of course, possible and perhaps necessary also to connect so that we don't deviate too much with our, with our artistic hypothesis, because, of course, I believe that uh, the human element or an animal element in, in each of us is there and we cannot only cover it with cultural elements. However, uh, exactly, I'm, I'm using Jacobson's functions for my research in order to classify also how a certain gesture in performance uh, may be attributed to one or another um, function of communication. And a lot of them actually talk exactly about uh, how certain things are consciously or unconsciously directed to enhance the receiver's uh, reaction, the audience's reaction to how uh, the performer expresses their musicality or say emotions or, or anything they want to convey about the piece. So, um, 
it's not only about what emotion one feels during the performer. It is quite evident from a variety of research that the performers act perhaps more than they feel on stage. That's why I've been always emphasizing during the paper the condition of a live performance, of, of a concert, of a public performance, uh, because it entails a lot of acting and enacting uh, rather than just feeling an emotion. I just have to hold the comment. So, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Uh, you make me think about those uh, works which precisely uh, try to, to break this relationship between the gesture and the significance in, in, in a performance or in a performance uh, or these gestures that, that the audience can recognize as uh, expressions of meaning. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about works like uh, Exit to Enter by, by Michael Bone, which uh, basically broke the logic between the gesture and the sound and the expression of of of, of what it what it is uh, usually uh, understood or, or shared by by the audience and, and the performer. So well, I think that, that those uh, those works just confirm what we, what you just exposed in in your, in your paper. And and I just wanted to know what do you think about about this kind of of other works. Actually, if, if I heard correct, I'm maybe not familiar with this work, but I'm very happy if you're saying that it confirms what, what my own findings. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so I think that maybe if there is no any other question, uh, we can move on with the next uh, afternoon. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is Anna Peta, uh, who's a philosopher and chemist, works as an associate professor in the Department of Aesthetics and Philosophy of Culture at the Institute of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge. Uh, her paper is entitled Performance as uh, Creation of Meaning. The identity of a musical work versus the uniqueness of its interpretations and prejudices for the purpose of revealing possible changes at the level of syndication when various pianists uh, expect a musical work, and the basis in this case of interpretations of the Andante from Schubert's uh, last piano sonata in the class major by uh, Sveslav Richter, Christian Zimmerman, and Katia Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm probably not the only one who wrote an abstract in for this conference long before the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> in this long time, my perspective has changed. Although I will try to keep the main threads uh, planned three years ago. The first one is the link between my reflection and the philosophical thought of the Polish phenomenologist Roman Ingarden, whose 50th anniversary was celebrated two years ago. Let us start with a reminder that Ingarden created coherent ontology of a work of art. I will recall a fragment of his deliberations on a musical work. <laughs> if you can change. If between the musical work and the multiplicities of auditory aspects by experiencing which the listener can hear the performance and through it to grasp the work itself, there is a connection. It is only that every musical work determines a certain ideal system of auditory aspects to be experienced by a listener if the work is to be given faithfully and fully in aesthetic experience, the end of quote. Not wishing to tire you for too long with phenomenology, I would like to point out immediately that from the point of view of Ingarden's theory, 
the title of my speech <coughs> is poorly formulated. Performance is not creating meanings. It is, however, uncovering it in the context of activating aesthetic values potentially present in the composer's work. Thus, all the meanings are present in the score as in Garden wrote in potentia. The performer reads them from the score and brings them to sounds. They are the fruit of the relationship between the subject, the performer, and the object, the work itself. Although in Garden does not take us beyond the score, as for example, Nicholas Cook does in his famous book, Beyond the Score, he suggests that the performer does not have to be afraid that the number of readings of the work is somehow limited. On the contrary, in Garden calls the musical work, I quote, an ideal limit to which various good performances aspire, although always departing from it to some extent. The end of quote. I do not intend to question in Garden's theory, which I respect as a philosopher and as a pianist. Someone may say, this is the old Platonism model in phenomenological clock. Let me confess that I do not consider it a disadvantage, but an advantage of this theory. Performing Western classical music, in my opinion as a pianist, is based on a journey to the source, which is always the composer's text for the performer. Next slide. Let me point out here the second thread of my speech. Time as a vehicle for the revelation of musical meanings, both in phenomenological, philosophical, and biological or physiological dimension. I believe that time allows the performer to navigate in a particularly creative way between the imperatives of the score and his or her unique vision of interpretation, or to put it differently, between necessity of the sport and freedom of our creativity. Time defines understanding and feeling of tempo, agogics, rubato, and phrasing. Simultaneously, however, it constitutes the basic dimension of our existence. It allows the performer to fuse with music and give it a shared life with his or her own life, if I can express it that way. Next slide. Many authors have written about musical time as a vehicle of me meaning. Let me briefly recall the concept of Gisèle Brelet, French musicologist and philosopher, uh, a student of Bergson and also a pianist. As a pianist, she wrote extensively on the art of performance. Her in-depth analysis was put forward in the two-volume book Le Temps Musical, where Brele offered a substantial and original account of musical time. Music, according to Brele, is the expression of the duration experienced by consciousness. As expression de la durée vécue de la conscience. She believes that the order of music, principally revealed by rhythm, affects our inner order. The involvement in musical time orders our experience of real time, which is interesting both from the perspective of the performer and for the audience, of course. In her article, Musique et Sagesse, the author notes, music, the master of time, is also the ruler of our souls. No other form of art can discipline us in such a radical manner. 
Music can do so because it orders the fundamental aspect of our existence. Through time, music can possess and fulfill the soul. Music can draw a soul away from its inner disorder. Yes, of course. Today, I do not intend to develop a particularly controversial thread in her reflection, which is treating music as a tool of the moral order. I just want to point out that Brelet appreciates the role of time as the dimension in which the existence of the performer is intertwined with that of music. I find it intriguing to take this trial more seriously. And while I do not accept Brelet's moralism without reservations, I take seriously her comments on the transparency of music through which we participate in the experience of the performer's time. And at this point, I would see the performer's chance to co-create meanings of the piece. Next slide, please. Uh, this vision does not have to contradict in the Daniel proposal. For him, I quote, the musical work presents a peculiar supratemporal object, which nevertheless possess an immanent quasi-temporal structure, the end of quote. Whereas the performance is a process, I quote, we perceive in it the whole fullness of its concreteness. And whenever we hear the same word in a new performance, this performance can be very much like earlier performances, but it differs from them at least in the new temporal quail, which is distinctive of the new performance. The end of form. We need not remind ourselves how much the temporal colorations shape other elements of the performance, above all the way of creating sound. Next slide. In order to move from theory to practice, let me quote a fragment of an amazing book by Paul Kildia, Chopin's Piano, A Journey Through Romanticism. This is a story of the modest, not to say mediocre, piano on which Chopin composed the cycle of preludes of his 24 in the monastery of Val de Mosa. My quote points to a specific, strange, unusual performance of prelude number four by Świętosław Rydze. What is controversial in this performance is the bizarre treatment of time. Paradoxically, however, this understanding of time by Richter reveals the profound mysteries of the prelude itself. I quote, the performance is so uncommonly slow with rubato applied to every shift in the train of harmonies left unblurred by both tempo and pedal. The simple elongated area in the treble stave given a wholly different sound from the accompaniment in the bass. The large vocal lift fell out almost laterally. The whole thing aimless, yet somehow also full of direction. Listening to it is disorienting. There is such a strange lurching suspension of expectation, as though Richter is employing words that have long since dropped from usage. Especially this last sentence is very beautiful. Next slide. Please. The author further states that although Richter probably did not know anything about the acoustics of the local cell in Valdemosa, or about the possibilities of the modest piano in Monastery, he managed to capture something so personal, so timeless 
with rubato unconstrained by time signature or modern convention. It is a perfect recreation of a sound and style lost in the wholesale shift in how Chopin had come to be played. The end of the quote. Finally, I modified the title of my speech. I try to perceive the performance not as creating, but as a co-creating or rediscovering or uncovering more or less hidden meanings of the score. It does not mean discovering the past without a living presence here and now. On the contrary, the more consciously the performer experiences his or her own cultural, social context and identity, the greater is the chance of creating a moving performance. In the abstract of my speech, I referred to the specific treatment of tempo from the Andante movement, from uh, the last piano sonata by Schubert, recorded by Czesław Richter, Christian Zimmermann, and more recently by Katia Buniatic. I really en encourage you to listen to these recordings, but uh, finally, using the presence of the piano, I will try to show what potential clues for pianist Schubert left in his piece, not for longer than four or five minutes. Uh, as you probably remember, according to Karol Berger, a published anthropologist, Schubert developed new digital means to put the listener into a trance. We can speak of a passive ideal of listening, which makes the listener and the music one. Schubert achieves this effect not only by turning to lyric, but also uh willingly using figures like for example ostinato figure which exists in the accompaniment of the andante from uh, the last uh, piano sonata uh, thanks to this a mood in german stimmung is created this is something different than really. Stimmung is a special color of our being in which man becomes one with the world, in this case with the world of music. A feeling always has an intentional object, while a mood is simply the tuning of man and the world in the same tone, we can say. So the performer has many options. He or she can build a flowing narrative and to think in long sections, for example, like this. this but I can show you just an impression of this 
of this um, broad perspective of musical time. <laughs> We are used to uh, Chopin um, from the point of view of time. And when you now analyze the performance uh, of the modern system, you think of time and space, also another scope, is, I think, very important and very fresh to the listen to Chopin, not only uh, a score, which is, of course, for Chopin, it's a value, but you cannot change anything, but you can add something in time and space of the other for, for this also that you can put yourself in the shoes of readers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> wonderful. You have a conscious thinking. Thank you very much. I have really maybe two questions I you know. The first will be connected with your change of the title. Mm -hmm. Not uh, creation of meaning, <laughs> performance is creation of meaning, but the mm -hmm. uh, performance is a co creator mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What do you think about the concept of Mirchesla Florashevsky? Mm -hmm. I mean, his statement that in music we have to do with so called ontological holiness, and performance is only one existence of the world because we have score 
We have homeless, we have our perception, we have also resonance and reception. Yeah. And this is wholeness, thanks to me, you can say ontological wholeness in music. From genesis, inspirations, to resonance and reception. So maybe you are right that you change the title from creation of meaning to uh, cope with everything or not. And the second maybe question will be connected with your wonderful statement that the former is between necessity of the score and freedom mm -hmm. of creativity. Mm -hmm. How do you, how we can develop this very important, I think, thought, yeah. mm -hmm. necessity and freedom personality, because the point is in personality and competent, I think, the competent knowledge. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for uh, your questions. Maybe I will be, it will be easier to, yes. <laughs> to be here. Uh, I will start from the second one. Uh, this is the big subject for philosophical investigation. I mean, the, this dialectic between truth and beauty. And this is the way uh, Polish philosopher Władysław Sturzewski went, and he developed this very beautifully in this work uh, concerning beauty. Um, so we have no time to develop this, but I think that this uh, mm, this is very well formulated by Beethoven in uh, probably last of his uh, uh, quartet, string quartet, uh, where he know knows that uh, the famous question "Muss es et muss sein?" "Muss es sein?" "Muss et muss sein?" As if he discovered something which is bigger than his creativity. So this is the, the, the answer to the second one. And the first one, uh, of course, I know this concept and I quoted Professor Tomaszewski many times. Um, and I really uh, appreciate this uh, theory of interpretation. Uh, and I encourage you to, 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 to read it also because it, sh it shows not only uh, point of view of uh, analytical philosophy, we can say, but also phenomenology and uh, hermeneutics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also semiotics. <laughs> of course. It is very universal and democratic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the democracy. I have a very, very short question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you when you're talking about uh, about the relations between uh, time and music, yes. you referred to yes. a very abstract uh, definition in which the word soul appears. So my question was <laughs> uh, in what sense? In a metaphysical sense, or maybe soul as a uh, as a synonym of mind? If the the latter one, what particular element do you mean? I think it was the, the quotation from Duelet, uh, it, it was connected only with spiritual dimension of our existence because for her, music uh, is a kind of uh, symbol of moral order. Mm -hmm. That's why it was the soul, not the mind. <laughs> <laughs> There any other questions? Thank you very much. So now our next paper is a paper entitled Analysis and Interpretation Relationships by Dominic Korevska, Kochnik. Professor Ludicologist and independent researcher. Her paper focuses on the problem of the abyss of separation that exists uh, between musicological analysis of a musical and vocal work and its concrete realization on the stage, and attempts to answer uh, the following question How to recreate 
on this stage by musical, vocal, and dramatic performance, uh, the thing gives signification to be understood. So, everyone know. However, musical art is a fiction or a reality. For the artist of vocation, the answer is of use. It is all his passion, all energy, and all love. Nothing can be more important than art. That is his reason of existence. If he is glad he has not to find someone to share that love with, he can be happy in life. If not, he is going to hell. True in art and fictitious in life. Conversely, the man happy in life and devoted to human goods may be fictitious in the art, even without being aware of it. Or confusedly, as Pablo Picasso, an exceptional painter who saw his talent as he compared it to himself. When I was young, like all young people, I had a religion of art, of great art. But over the years, I realized that art, as it, as it was conceived until the end of the 18th century, is hence for Phoenician, moribund, condemned, and that the, the alleged artistic activity with all its abundance. It's only it's only the multifaceted manifestation of its agony. There were great painters like Giotto, Tissier, Rembrandt, and Goya. I am only a public entertainer, entertainer who, who invested his time and who exhausted the imbecility, the vanity, the greed of his contemporaries at best. What I want to talk about today is art as religion, as faith, as devotion, and as cross. Problematic. The criterion of sincerity, authenticity of the composer, the artist rather, is therefore the first step in analysis and interpretation. Thus, we will choose only masterpiece because they offer the characteristics. In truth, no life gives birth to art. If so, no spiritual form will exist. Only exists the proper, beautiful, or captivating facility. Thematic, Beethoven had and after it, such a suit. How then analyze the 19th symphony today? Also, John Walter Love, the hymn of the return to the creator, second. Method and application. Results of previous research. Each Brahms work can be summed up number one. A summit summarizing everything and pointing the to speak toward the highest signification. The 19th symphony at its top contemplates both from the first to the last movement, this symphony in one piece signifies the dying spark awaited with an immense sacred hope which suddenly bursts into the storm and strikes down the earth, upsetting the human conscience. Then rises the hymn to the creator, the father beyond the star, Hebrew Sternen Selts. Brüder, Hebrew Sternen Selts, muss ein lieber Vater wohnen, ich stütze nieder Millionen. Hannes to den Schöpfer Quelz such in über, über Sternenzelt, über Sternen muss ein Herr wohnen. Bei beiden Spark, we untie into 
heavenly sanctuary finished by the Father. She's the largest one. The spiritual form from the bottom to the top, and from the top to the bottom, the composition witnesses the spirit. All sky like foundations are of the behind the pyramid witness God diamond soul. Whichever side one enters into it and in it, in its hideous thought fell, above all, into the musical and textual logic of its construction, whatever the epoch of analysis or interpretation. Conclusion and results. Throughout the composition, from beginning to end, we must grasp the spark that strikes beyond any other harmonic or structural logic, even if it is cry of this harmony. The spark of signification must shine above all, carrying its thunderbolt from God. God Translated into a modern, abstract, and no longer romantic musical language, provided by the spark, sparkles, and the lightning falls in a dodecaphonic or, or, or electroacoustic composition, we run and fetch full the thought of the poem at the heart of signification. All interpretations are a road and contemporary recreation. If the force of the thought is painful, present, and always growing in future and vision. At, at the moment when the intangible form is designed into mind, the, all combination of colors of sound will seem the human to joy. New problematic analysis and interpretation relationships introduction. Entering into a composer's work for penetrating his deepest thoughts, conscious or subconscious, is both again the fruit of enormous analysis work and of necessary experience on the stage. Contact with the listener is indeed decided. This code it allows to take necessary distance between inner thought and stronger external perception. The subtle relationship between analysis and interpretation is a challenge for the artist musicology. In the framework of this analysis of Beethoven's Nietzsche symphony, it is up to the conductor to make the significant musical elements of the lightning and the storm dominate and to balance the composition in order to link these elements together. <laughs> From the beginning to the end of the movements, Carrying them away in a single continuous discourse of which bursts apotheosis thought in the last moment, releasing the message, the dying spark, which brings the revelation of the dying of the importance of the former. Obviously, this architecture of interpretation requires the submission of all musical and poetic elements to this main idea, transcendent, which magnet, magnifies all the prison and the potential potential of the master piece. Applying this method of analysis to our specific field, lyrical art, we propose here in conclusion an essential expert from the technology by Richard Wagner, composer to admire Beethoven 
for having weaker orchestra and voice, music and signification in a continuous discourse. Rawless, which already announces the continuous melody of the light motif. The Valkyrie Act 3, Standard 3. Rudyhild, the Valkyrie at the foot of water, one she has to traduce in her bear, please her cows. The light motifs of the melody into the voice and orchestra suggest the real meaning of this monologue. She, the cult of Wotan, only carried out the will of the god, resulting of his errors, the part with the giants, and of the curse of the ring by the black arbor, arborish, to warm Wotan snatched it by desire of omnipotence. The curse bites, bites on bottom and on all its race and its work because he did not return the ring to the right mountains. Really, this course is perfectly coherent in the point of the logical and musical significance of the light of the spiritual, spiritual daughter of Bolton, she the incarnate will of the God. She protects the semi-diving that Sungen's rust against Bolton's a helpless will end according to his true design. At least that's what Brilliant believes. However, if we accept our analysis of the tetralogy as a world, its privation, its relation to the extension, that is to say the all poetry but secret, even for Brunel, we of Potter, the end, the end, the end of current work. What the musical light motifs ahead of the dramatic action announced in Saint Three Act Two of the Valkyrie. How to interpret this passage where Brunei, the devoted child, realized the deep and forbidden desire of her father, Walter. Brunehill will only understand at the end of the tetralogy in the Twilight of the North the true ultimate will of Bottom, but he conceals into his enigmatic words, but that subtly the light motives to the will. It is only at the extreme end of the tetralogy, the Twilight of the Gods, before her, her immolation into fire, but the Valkyrie will understand Alas, vice fish, I know for the dream. How upsetting the, the infolding of the drama, placing the, the ultimate meaning at the top of the contraction of the world, revealed on this passage, Stagnancy by doing away with all the useless standing action secondary characters set together. How should we interpret Runehill's bleeding in the fair art of the Valkyrie? Hypothesis of fashion. If we make the tetralogy a modern, contemporary masterpiece, exploiting all the present technical resources, for example, of the cinema, parallel crossed shots, past, present, and future melted into a single vision, putting at the peak of the work its signification, and therefore the message toward the future. How would this masterpiece be rewritten and be interpreted and interpreted today? Our proposition by making all light motives in the same molten tank by extracting the rich parts of their totality, that is to say, of their signification, not their addition, 
but the hierarchy, giving birth to the element, to the element essential, by revealing the drama from its summit, Volkan's way. This is this in a total knowledge of the work, analyzed in the real order of the essential. Possibility but in this interpretation, but this recreation in a single summit, the highest, will make evident, even in an abstraction, discarding the most audacious harmonic and musical aesthetic runs of various epoch. The master, it is by the main island, conscious or subconscious, which generated his masterpiece and which can nourish its person. This therefore a total composition but we propose. As would be in painting the abstract form of the battle of the green bar by Matteo. With this additional advantage, total freedom of composition, design, shape, chorus, rights. The only goal is that Wagner masterpiece will really be, be understood today because transposed in its transcendence. Last remark, in this perspective, how to sing, send, uh, send uh, or act uh, of divine fear, must brutally know everything or must be the interpretation of the music in a head of the text, subtly suggests but she does not no, she does not know everything. Here is a true that dramatist of this category of dramatic soprano voice to that very rare. I don't know. Uh -huh. Difficult to approach in this concrete uh, this this uh, little problem you have seen. Yeah. Interpretation, I told interpretation it is at the foot of offense, the hierarchy 
she and this thing, she 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 um calls the thing but from the um the topic it is not true the barnek przepraszam po polsku dzisiaj barnek miał chęć barnek to jest ten kraloć tego porta a potem persona jako potem is very 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 important on the side of orders i brenne ile ona się des understood at the very very end at the very very about like motives like motives you know according with maps okay good okay very soft and it works very enigmatic okay so as a performer you must take all this into to do in circles very good then tell me yes of course because i guess they're musical but i it's true and practice Okay, so thank you very much, Monique. Um, thank you.